and welcome to the Squiggly Careers podcast. I'm Helen and I'm here with Sarah. Hi everyone. And this is episode 101 of the Squiggly Careers podcast. <laughs> Hooray! Um, yeah, I feel like now we can't celebrate any more numbers until we get to 200 or something. It's like a really long way to celebrate <laughs> yeah. now. But last week's podcast, which hopefully if you listened to, last week's was a really special one for us because it was episode 100. And instead of being in our own homes recording late at night, which is the reality of this podcast, we were in a lovely theatre in London with lots of people that have supported and followed the Squiggly Careers podcast and some amazing speakers. So it was a episode 100 was a really special moment. Not that today is not also going to be a special moment, but it was something a little bit different in last week's podcast. So if you have not listened to that and you want to hear a bit about how to make work better for everyone from people that are already doing it, then make sure you go and listen to that one. But this week, we're going to be talking about mastering meetings. We did a survey on Instagram about topics they wanted to cover, and this one came up pretty highly. But maybe before we dive into all things meetings, it's Sarah's first day back from holiday, I think, Pretty officially. much. Yeah. Straight back <laughs> in. Your, straight back in, Sarah. Straight back into podcast recording. How was your holiday? It was good. We had a few events that happened along the way. Okay. I had some uh, insect bites that basically meant my hands swelled up to the point where it made me realise what I'd look like if I was twice the size, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and um, our toddler's bag went missing, didn't okay. ever come off the plane, and that had got all of his clothes, all of his swimming stuff, all of his nappies, all of his toys. All he had was the clothes he was standing up in. So that was interesting. We got it back, but that took a couple of days. So he was wearing whatever we could scrounge from the local supermarket, which was obviously absolutely fine. But it was really nice. It was a nice week away, much slower pace of life. And as I think I said on one of my Instagram posts, my main decision every day was what time to have a Magnum, essentially. That was it. That was was the main decision I was making. Other than well, Magnums, because I'm not, I'm not sorry yeah. about them. But... Uh, yeah, yes, I food that I really like. It's probably not quite your equivalent of really nice food, <laughs> but you know, one day actually <laughs> talking about things that were a little bit tricky at times. Most of the time, the weather was really great, but one day it did rain a bit, and we were on the beach, and I was with my sister who uh, loves the sun. And so she came back from like the beach bar a bit with coffees because it was a bit cold. Oh wow! But uh, but, but a Snickers ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so we were there with our coffees and Snickers ice cream which actually made us pretty happy to be honest and it was only that one day so it was okay so well I'm glad you're back I'm very I'm very happy oh, good. I've got a, a list of lovely things to talk to you about this week so uh, <laughs> but before then uh, our podcast night then about meetings out of 10 Sarah what's your view on a meetings do you love them 10 out of 10 or one avoid at all costs oh that's a good question I'm definitely not in the I hate meetings camp you know, yeah. some people really, like, really dislike them, the idea of them being in them. And I think I've spent a lot of time in meetings that have been really useful and relevant and even, as dare I say, enjoyable. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm probably in, like, the 8 out of 10 camp oh, in eight, terms of meetings. Yeah, I think I am... I see how valuable meetings can be. And I think they sometimes get a really bad press. I have been in meetings that I was reading a bit about meetings before the podcast and people were talking about them as being like time suckers. <laughs> <laughs> and I have been in meetings, you know, where you're thinking, I've got so much to do and I'm sitting here and this does not feel like a good use of my time. And we'll talk about what you should maybe do if that's how you're feeling. But I do understand and have definitely been in a position of thinking, oh, this is either just really badly organised or not a good use of time. But in the main, I would say I've had a lot of positive meeting experiences. How about you? I think I might be a six out of ten. I think I've been bruised (laughs) bruised (laughs) by meetings. Not so much now, but I think in previous roles, previous organisations, I think the domination of my diary from meetings like going from one to the next Mm. has just and feeling like oh how do I escape these and trying a few different ways to reduce the amount of meetings that I was in but then maybe a couple of months later finding myself back in like a meeting trap I have so much more freedom now about the meetings that I put in the diary and choose to go to and I would love some of that efficiency and freedom to be reflected in corporate life because sometimes I didn't feel like I had it so and hopefully today people listening we can share with you some of the things that work for us in meetings like some things in good meetings some things in bad meetings but like really give you some tips about stuff that we think will help you to make meetings work for you because maybe people come at these things from different perspectives so I did a bit of a google search about what other people say about meetings and came up with a few quotes that maybe smile actually 
vastly more negative about meetings. Uh, there was one from John Kenneth Galbraith, who was an economist, and he said that meetings are indispensable when you don't want to do anything. <laughs> quite, quite harsh. Oh. Um, and another one by someone called Lee Clo or Clow, who said actions speak louder than meetings. <laughs> yeah. I did find a really positive one from Nancy Klein, who is someone that um, Sarah and I have come across in coaching work, actually. And I think this is really true. This resonates with me. A manager's ability to turn meetings into a thinking environment is probably an organisation's greatest asset. Oh, I'm just thinking now how many meetings... I would say have been a thinking environment. Mm. So I'm not. I'm actually not sure I've been in that many that would be more of a thinking environment. The ones that I've been in, yeah, I think the thinking ones where stuff's created and everybody contributes and you come out with it with something different than you went in. Like they feel yes. like valuable yeah. uses of time. Yeah, I suppose I was thinking. I don't think I do my best thinking in a meeting, which I think is true for a lot of people. But I guess if you can do like collaborative thinking, if you can come mm. up with ways to do that. I can see how that would be really positive. So our plan for podcast today is we're going to talk about some of our experiences of meetings, some common wisdom and whether we agree with it about how to make meetings work and then really get into the things that we think really do make a difference. But maybe first, we always try and tie things back to why it's relevant in a squiggly career. Sarah, have you got a perspective on this? Yeah, I think when you look at how many meetings people are in now, um, certainly all of the research that we found suggests that people are in more meetings than ever before. Apparently, people typically spend a total of 187 hours, which is 23 days a year in meetings. And I'm thinking about jobs that I've done in the past that have definitely had more than 23 days of the year in meetings. 56% of people believe that they're unproductive and a waste of time. <laughs> um, and lots of people, which I quite like the fact that people admit this, admit to making excuses in order to avoid the meetings. <laughs> but I think when you think about how we're all working now, actually the importance of making meetings effective and efficient probably has never been so important because actually very few people work in isolation. We're collaborating, but in ever more sort of complicated, I guess, and dynamic ways. So people are likely to be in different locations. You're likely to be in and out of various different teams. You're likely to be in some meetings that might be internal ones, some that are likely to be external. And so just the your ability to be quite ambidextrous in terms of different types of meetings for different purposes, which we'll talk about a bit, I think is only going to increase. There might be some meetings that are all about collaboration, some that might be about building relationships, resolving challenges. I do think that meetings might be one of those things that have got a bit of a bad press. Mm -hmm. I feel like people, maybe, maybe we should do this one day, but lump it into all of those words that people associate with things they don't want to do at work. So networking meetings there are quite a few things i think that because feedback, people have often, yeah, emotionally feedback. laden words yeah and it's usually those things don't come from nowhere they come from people who are having had bad experiences which then impact their point of view and their perspective on why they don't want to do those things why you don't want to do meetings or feedback but i think if you think about why those things exist in terms of collaboration building relationships taking action, resolving challenges, they're all things that we would all want to do. We'd all want the outcome of, I think, what meetings are intended for. Mm. It's just that the process often seems to either be badly managed or get in the way. And I think increasingly, as we're all thinking about how we spend our time, and I'm always really reassured when I see people, you know, talking more openly and transparently about how they are using their time or they're using their time well, what I actually hope is that people will really start to question meetings, all the meetings they're in, from their own perspective, as well as kind of the people around them to think about, has that been a good use of time? Has that been a productive use of time? If it hasn't, what are you going to do about it? Taking accountability to actually talk about it or do something yourself or speak to your team about how you might want to do things differently. Because I do sense that increasingly people are going, I don't have the time to waste or the time to spare mm. to sit for 90 minutes on a conference call where I've not said anything to me I could imagine that 10 years ago 
I'm not sure I can imagine that maybe as much now. I don't know. Maybe our maybe our listeners will tell me differently. But I'm hoping that's certainly not what people are spending their time doing. <laughs> So when I was at Microsoft, there was a really cool piece of software that was like embedded within Outlook at Microsoft. I think it was called like My Analytics. I should probably remember the time, like the title of this, but it effectively analysed how much time you spent doing like your email versus how much time you were spending in meetings Ooh. and whether they were meet. It was really interesting whether there were meetings that you had scheduled or whether there were other people's meetings, and it gave you like a glance at a week at like what the split of your time was and actually if you were a manager I think it gave you some visibility on your team as well really interesting and one thing that stuck out in my mind actually was that I think in my mind I was spending more time in meetings than the data actually showed me because <laughs> I think it's always like <laughs> I, I know I know I was like oh, I'm in all these meetings all the time and then looks at the data it's like oh, actually you have got quite a bit of downtime Helen <laughs> like it's not in meetings every single hour of every single day but I think always like it's the emotion that um that meetings maybe brings that sort of clouds your perspective and judgment sometimes so maybe a little bit of an audit of um how much time you're actually spent in meetings and are they meetings that you have scheduled in which case hopefully you've got a good reason for having them or are they meetings that other people have scheduled just might give you a little bit of perspective as a bit of a starting point so should we talk a bit about maybe some of our most memorable meetings Go on. um <laughs> what we what we've learned from them we won't spend too long on this but we'll just give a couple of examples and then we're going to go into some top tips some from other people which we'll share our point of view on and some just things that we found really useful that might be good for you to try at work so let's start with the good good meetings that you've had over the course uh, of your career yeah. what stands out the, the one really, really stands out. And it's a long time ago, actually. So I have had more meetings since then. But it probably would be now about 10 years ago. And I was working for Capital One. And I was working on a particular project. And something quite significantly went wrong with the project. I will leave the details there. But it required a lot of people to get into a room to solve it. And I remember we were in like a room that probably had like a c- official capacity you know like when you book your rooms and it says this is for eight people probably an yeah. official capacity of about like eight to ten people but we had to have about 30 people in the room because it was almost like a swap meeting in that everybody everyone had to come together so the people from operations from it from marketing from pr all to try and get together to solve this problem and i was leading the marketing part of it and a person who happens to now be my husband was leading the it <laughs> part of it this was before we were together so it's sort of memorable because it was sort of at the start of me getting to know the person that I'm now married to um, in, a, in a work context. But also See, because... good outcome of a meeting. I know, I know. Not <laughs> the outcome of every meeting you're going to get, I hope. Or so that, would, that would be not dodgy ground. But um, I think why it sticks in my mind, other than the personal element of it, was it was what you might classify as a work crisis. I'm sure there are more significant ones, but it was one of the ones that was like, we need to get on this very quickly because it's got significant implications for our customers. And everybody came together. So it was really action focused. Everybody had a perspective. They were collaborating. They were trying to solve a problem. Nobody doubted that they needed to be in that room. And we were able to then from that room identify work streams so that you didn't need 30 people in every single meeting afterwards. You needed some of those people to head up some work streams and then the people that headed up those work streams could come and be in a meeting. But it just felt like the right people in the right room at the right time all working together on an outcome with a bit of a pace, a bit of a purpose behind it. And I wouldn't want to create a crisis in order to have that meeting again. But there was a a lot that I remember about how that helped to solve a problem quite quickly by doing that. Yeah, and actually I've heard other people talk about this before in other organisations I've worked in where leaders have talked about if actually we could act like we do when something goes wrong the rest of the time, how Mm. efficient you would be. Because I Mm. think sometimes that outside or external factor forces you to behave in a certain way. And that way is actually can be really productive because it gives you, I guess, a sense of urgency and motivation and there's no room for too much dilemma or I suppose it, it just gets everybody very focused um, mm. and I have and, and yeah it's unrealistic to recreate that but I do also wonder if that's a little bit what it's like to be in a startup mm. and I suppose we should probably know this because that's essentially what we are I was just <laughs> as I was saying that sentence I was like oh is that us but a startup like Uber for example when they were very first starting <laughs> or we work one of those sorts of startups and I wonder whether because they typically, you know, you've got to grow really quickly. You've got a lot of pressure from potentially from investors and all those kind of things. 
again, I often sense that those people very much spend time together. You know, that's often where you hear people talk about stand-up meetings or 10-minute meetings at the start of the days or, you know, 15-minute huddles, those sorts of things where everything is just super productive and focused on outcomes. You know, meetings don't have to be an hour just because that's what goes in your calendar, which definitely happens, doesn't it, in organisations yeah. where time is gets blocked the, out the just default. because that's what the default is. Yeah, yeah. And actually quite a lot has been written about that, I think, in terms of does a meeting have to be 30 minutes? Why could it not be 20? Why does a meeting have to be 60 minutes? Could it not be 50? You know, and people just don't experiment with those things just because we're all creatures of habit. And I found that really fascinating. And for a while, Sainsbury's tried, um, I think it was 45 minute meetings because we had a lot of our meetings. The whole idea as well was to get rid of all these kind of back-to-back meetings and to give people a bit of time and space. If you had got a couple of back-to-back meetings, you had got at least some gaps to get yourself a cup of tea, nip to the loo, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, 15 minutes is not that long. But I do like that idea of like challenging how long does a meeting actually have to be. Um, so what's one of your memorable positive meeting experiences? I always quite liked, actually, some of the very formal meetings that I've been in, which might surprise people given what we do and probably the way that I work and some of the other things that I talk about on our other podcast episodes. But certainly at one point at Sainsbury's when I was working and going to talk to people who were at board level quite frequently, there was a very clear way of approaching those meetings. And the bit that really sticks out for me is there was certainly a phase when I was in a role where before these very big, quite important meetings, you submitted a one page summary, which outlined, you know, the context what you were recommending and gave anyone any information that they needed, but you got to summarise it in a page, which I really liked because then that made you be concise. It made sure you knew what you thought and Mm. you kind of really thought it through, which I found that quite a useful pre-meeting preparation. There was a real commitment um, from everybody that they would read it before you walked in the room. And it was very obvious kind of if you hadn't. So everybody kind of held each other to account to that. And when you went into the meeting for your like allocated slot, because that's how it works, you did get your allocated slot, you went straight to discussing your recommendation. You didn't recap on everything that was in the one page summary. So it was straight into, so you'll have read my paper recommending whatever we do this thing. I'm ready to get your views, basically go straight into what was a discussion rather than, and I have been in lots of big companies where meetings are just basically one-way presentations. Mm. So in lots of ways, they're more scary because you're you're having like a proper discussion. You have to have a conversation, whereas it's somehow easier to just present stuff because you can really practice that and you can hone it. You're much more likely to be put on the spot. You might not know the answers to questions. I always felt when those meetings were more like that, where you went straight to, okay, well, let's just get straight into a discussion about the recommendation, what do people think, that it was so much more useful. You got really valuable insights from people. And I would really recommend that if you are in an organisation where you have any ability to think about basically what happens before a meeting, what happens after a meeting. I think that can be just as important as the meeting itself. Um, And again, I saw in Sainsbury's, certainly actually somebody I worked for did a really good job of after meetings, giving people feedback, really short feedback from this specific meeting that she sort of chaired and that just became again an expectation so pre these meetings you were doing these one page summaries so it wasn't a million page powerpoint deck or that kind of stuff people had read it you knew that when you turned up you had a good conversation you came out you knew you were going to get some feedback on how you'd done and if there was anything you could improve for next time and to me that just felt really purposeful and useful you would got all the right people in the room you either got your recommendation agreed but even if you didn't that didn't feel like you'd failed. It just felt like you'd had a good conversation and left with more knowledge than you had probably when you started. So it was a really good example, I think, of a big corporate really thinking about how to use people's time in the best way possible. It's that thing, you know, so that you left with more information than you started with. It's that idea that something has happened in the meeting that has been sort of additive, you know, like yeah, so you, added value. people Yeah, people have come away with something better than they would have had if they'd not been in that meeting. And when that hasn't been the case, it feels like a waste of time because that time could have been spent in other things. So we've done things that feel really good. Have you got a memorable meeting that didn't feel so good? Yeah. Yeah. Go on, I, I, I'm laughing a bit because I was thinking, I haven't actually double checked with Helen this is okay to talk about so I'm just going to assume it's okay to talk about so Helen and I had a meeting a couple of weeks ago um that didn't go very well 
I sometimes get worried that people think that we get all this stuff right all the time because we love it and spend lots of time thinking about it, but we absolutely don't. And we went into a meeting. It was an important meeting. It was important that we were both there. We were talking about some marketing ideas for our book. Um, so we were really excited and really excited to be in the meeting. And we both came out feeling like it just hadn't been quite right, that something hadn't been right in that meeting. And I think what had happened is we'd both tried to do everything in that meeting. So we'd both tried to lead it. We both tried to ask questions. We were both trying to write down all the actions. And it really kind of came to the fore where afterwards, like basically we both had to write our actions up of which 80% would have been the same. And then we had to like fill in each other's gaps. So it was a really inefficient for both of us. All it needed beforehand when we sort of chatted about it afterwards was probably a five minute chat before to just think about how we were going to approach that meeting. And actually, I remember you coming out of that meeting and feeling almost a bit down because you felt yeah. like you would contributed to it. And it was a really, what should have been a really exciting meeting with some people that we really enjoy spending time with actually ended up being something that we had kind of depleted our, or, or certainly your energy. I think I'd sort of taken too much of the lead, so I was feeling okay. <laughs> but you, know, you, you definitely didn't come out of that meeting feeling very good. What was really good about it, what I was really pleased with is that we both spotted it and I think where you're brilliant then is calling it really soon. So I don't think I'd even got on the train by the time I'd had the WhatsApp from Helen going, that didn't feel good slash right. Hmm, let's think about that. And really quickly, we were both really open to going, yeah, do you know what? It didn't. And we don't want to do that because that's not a really good use of our time. And then we dissected it really quickly to just think about, okay, so did we both need to be in a meeting? And we decided that, yes, that we did, in that instance we did, but there might be some where we don't. Okay, when we're both in a meeting together, how do we divide up our roles and responsibilities? Because as both trying to do everything is not sensible and not smart. And we're both used to historically playing quite similar roles in our respective organisations, leading teams, often being the person calling meetings, facilitating meetings. And you can't both do that. And you can't both do that all the time. Um, and so I think that's what I would really encourage people to do is if you do have a meeting where you think that just didn't feel right. Sometimes it's really obvious because you come out and you're just like, oh, God, that was awful. Or you come out and maybe a bit more like Helen and I did and you just felt that just wasn't quite right. That just didn't feel, I don't feel like I've been given energy or feel positive after that, after something that should have felt good. And just ask yourself, why not? What what was it? And then what could you change? And honestly, we got so excited about giving each other feedback. We wanted to do another meeting like straight away, <laughs> <laughs> which I think tells you just how much into this stuff we are. I was like, oh, I really wish we had another meeting tomorrow because then we could practice. And Helen was like, you're the only person I know who would want another meeting <laughs> just area. to practice some of this stuff. But I did. And... So it wasn't good. Um, I don't think either of us thought it was very good. And in lots of ways, you do feel a bit disappointed. But it goes back to that growth mindset of thinking, that's okay. I see that as a challenge and something to learn from and get better at, not as a failure. Now it's like, I think it's very on our mind that before meetings, just saying, okay, what's the role we're both playing? Is someone note taking? Is someone asking questions? Is someone taking the lead? And it clarifies it. And I think it helps the person who might not be doing the role that they would automatically do know why they're not doing it or just yeah it's much much clearer god then so what's your you, you can't have the same one <laughs> have you, have you so got a different I also one? want to reflect but my reflection's quite different yeah. <laughs> you know, have you seen that um do you watch the affair on the tv yes yeah, o- yeah. on the tv on the tv on the tv sound like you're about 100 on that thing called the tv on that thing on the tv you know how they have them um, for people that haven't seen it it's a really good program but they show you scenes from two different people's angles so it's like yeah, this yeah. is what sarah thought of that meeting and this is what <laughs> helen thought oh like no a, yeah no, 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 no. That- that, that would be a good there's got to be a podcast episode in that surely I like mean, every, yeah. a number of people who've all experienced the same thing giving their feedback and their perspective to hear how different people Ooh. have different experiences of the same factual reality okay all right Ooh. we'll add it to the list have a make a note um yeah my uh, meeting thing that didn't go so well I'm not going to name the organization but it was an organization that had quite a lot of meetings I was on a leadership team that had sort of it morphed and morphed and morphed and like as in there were people on there and they came, seemed to keep inviting people across the business onto this leadership <laughs> team so there was one particular meeting and this leadership team sort of met about every six weeks for a whole day sometimes two days I think once it even met for a week and I'm not even joking and no. I think I know I know and there were about I think this particular meeting there were about 16 people yeah about 16 people in the leadership meeting 
the meetings were quite dysfunctional because there were everyone was a head of a department and that was like 16 different functional leaders in the room who all had a perspective. So generally the meetings just sort of lost a bit of thread because everyone was trying to lead and um, sort of to the point that Sarah was saying before really it never really felt great. So an external facilitator was brought in to make right. the meeting a bit more efficient but it just became ridiculous at one point the external facilitator like we were going around the table all sharing our comments because that seemed to be the way that this particular facilitator thought this meeting would run better if we each had a minute to talk but when it got to him he was the facilitator when it got to him rather than just like moving on to the next person he also started commenting <laughs> on the business like he was he wasn't even in the business he was an external facilitator who started to give oh, his no. perspective on some quite complicated like marketing and operations stuff and i was like brilliant this how is there now a 17th person <laughs> This is how like this is how bad oh, this like is. At the office. Oh my! It was. It was like we just started to absorb people into this really messy situation. Mm. Yeah, and that's probably when I started feeling like, oh my goodness, I like I cannot. You know, when situations are almost like you say in the office, it almost become so bad they become funny. It's like does yeah. no one does nobody else see how crazy <laughs> this is. But I think the answer was no. I think it was just me. <laughs> I do think there is a point about how many people can be in a meeting. Agreed. To be able to effectively contribute, because I have seen that quite a few times where there are just too many people in there. And so there is no way all of those people can be heard and have the opportunity to contribute. And at that point, I think that's too many. That's If people are in that room and you're actually going to run out of time or it's going to take a full day before everyone can share their point of view, that, that can't be the right way to do it. Should we move on to our top tips and let's yeah, let's okay. talk about what, what let's, or, let's or some on. yeah some interesting things that you come across and just yeah, our kind of points of view on them. Uh, so number one, then the common advice that all meetings should have an agenda, uh, like agenda, clear objectives, and if you have that, it's automatically a better meeting. What is your perspective? I thought this interesting because so intuitively, when I first read that, I thought, yep. I'm on board. I'm on board with having an agenda. I think that's useful. And I've been in lots of companies where that's really standard. But I do wonder if there are, and it probably depends a bit on how you're defining meetings. I think as part of that agenda, or probably maybe even more important than that agenda, is being really clear on what the outcome is of that meeting. Because I do think sometimes you're meeting, you might be meeting with one person or just a couple of people. And the, the outcome of that meeting might be to build a brilliant relationship with those two people because they're people that you need to work with across different parts of the organisation or outside of your organisation. I think at times that's more important than an agenda where you go, right, we must follow X, Y and Z. And I do think some people probably respond better to an agenda than others. Mm. And you've got to give people the time and the space to be able to contribute and I think some people just naturally will rile against an agenda meeting where you must talk about these things for exactly this amount of time. When I've seen meetings run really well, particularly when it's very clear who is running and leading that meeting, if a topic comes up that is really important and it becomes clear it's going to take more than the 10 minutes on the agenda, to me, the best leaders have recognised that actually it's better to keep that conversation going to at least some extent rather than just stopping at exactly that 10 minutes. So it's better to take something else off the agenda than stopping what is a productive conversation because I've seen people do it the other way where they've just done that and I hate the phrase, okay, we just can't talk about this anymore, we've got to take it offline and that yeah. just makes me want to die inside anyway. <laughs> but um, just doing that I think feels counterproductive and I think the smart facilitators, the best leaders of meetings have really good judgment. They know when actually it is time to stop and actually recognise that something is better discussed in a future meeting or with a smaller group of people, and they know when to let the conversation run. And that, that I think, is a real judgment call, probably comes from a bit of an experience, from like knowing the business that you're in, the people who are in that room. But when it's done well, I think it's done brilliantly. So I, I think I'm pro-agenda, but kind of not at all costs. I think of it, I don't know if it's been Roxy Moron, but I think of it as like an informal agenda. So if someone was like really rigid with there are only three points and like that's it, 
I wouldn't like that. And I also wouldn't like if I didn't get to contribute to what that agenda should be. But if I think about, um, I don't know, so you and I, Sarah, we will co-create an agenda over yeah, WhatsApp. Yeah, we do. We'll yeah. be like, okay, we've got a day together. What are all the things we want to cover? I mean, arguably, sometimes we put way too much on an agenda. <laughs> but... <laughs> like, that's just us, I think. I don't but... think that's arguable. I think we just do. <laughs> <laughs> but it is co-created and we do have a list and it's pretty informal. It's on WhatsApp, but we then refer back to that during when we're together. Yeah. We're like, okay, what's the most important? And if suddenly we were a bit short of time, we'll go back to our list and say, okay, there are five things left. We've only got time for two. Let's prioritise two. So I think that to me is like the informal agenda and it's it's like an active agenda. If your time changes or you discuss something a bit too much, we're constantly sort of re-looking at well, what's the priority, what can we cover off quickly, what can we do while we're having lunch versus what's requires us to be near a whiteboard or something. And I find it really useful to just sometimes, in, when I'm sending an invite to somebody, let's say I've had a chat with someone on the phone, I'll be like, okay, let's meet in person or it's been over email. I'll normally just put one or two bullet points in the Outlook invite. And it's not like, hi, for our meeting at nine o'clock, we'll cover this. I'll just be like, two main things to cover are the plan for this and the ownership yeah. for this and it's not even that nicely politely written but it's just like as a reminder top things to cover are and then I find that really useful when you've got quite a few meetings on you're like okay I'm with this person today and what were we talking about again and it's almost it's just a bit of a reference point rather than being something that I have to really stick to so I am pro providing they are a bit informal yeah I think so so how about having stand-up meetings then? Mm. So very fashionable to have a stand-up meeting, huddles or various different phrases that are used for them. Uh, have you ever done stand-up meetings? Yeah, I have. So the logic is that you're supposed to save time because yeah. stand-up meetings are supposed to be shorter and more responsive. So I have experienced them in one organisation for probably about three months before they all just, the team basically like were like, this is awful. <laughs> Rebelled. <laughs> yes. I'm like, Brilliant. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. People were like, this is horrendous. It's not good. And I have... Were they all stand-up meetings? Like everyone. Uh, no, 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 they weren't okay. all. There was a daily stand up right. um, in a sort okay. of a startup, a startup environment. And I have coached somebody who has had lots of stand up meetings and also didn't like them. So I think my experience is personally and from people that I am connected to that they have not been positive. And the reason they haven't been positive is that they are you can't kind of get out of them. Like they're in the diary every day. Everyone has to be there. It overrides everything else, like all the points of having stand-up meetings. And sometimes that feels like you're just... My experience was people were there that didn't feel like they need to be there, but the principles of stand-up meetings are you've all different departments have got to be there and hear from each other. So I think people thought they had... It reduced their freedom and their choice. Yeah. Because uh, it really forced them to give up half an hour and they often overran anyway. So maybe a stand up meeting done in a startup run efficiently is good, but I have not experienced that or had conversations with people who have experienced that. And maybe what I have an experience is the principle of a stand up meeting, not in a startup environment. So almost like let's take two of our sit down meetings that we have a week and turn them into a stand up meeting just because. Like I haven't seen it translated into the environment, I've just had the startup slightly inefficient operation of a stand-up meeting in a startup <laughs> environment and I'm against that. <laughs> I've been in meetings where people choose to stand up <laughs> yes. um, because actually you're coming up with ideas or you're working something through and I think that could be really useful. People being able to like move around and just go and use a whiteboard yeah, if they want yeah. to or just going to look out the window or leaning or just... I actually work with a couple of people now who do that I don't feel obliged to stand up with them because that would feel weird. But I do recognise that they that it is useful. I don't even know if they know they're doing it, but I can see that it is useful for them as they're thinking. It helps them with, you know, kind of being creative, I guess. And I'm often in kind of a creative environment. The other thing I do like is uh, walking meetings, which takes standing up meetings one step further, I guess. <laughs> um <laughs> But I've only ever done walking meetings where you're doing, obviously, like one-to-one -one meetings. Um, mm. I've never done, like, oh, as a whole team. team, let's all try <laughs> and walk amazing. and have a meeting. <laughs> but I have done one-to-ones and where maybe we've even chosen because we're going to something else together and we'll think, well, if we leave a bit earlier, we could walk there. Oh, and actually, while we're walking, why don't we be quite specific what we're going to talk about and try and tackle this problem together or, like, talk through what we think. And I can see that has been useful because I think there is something about you know, your brain works in a different way when you're moving. Sometimes it's quite useful if you're talking about a difficult topic, if you're not making eye contact. I think it gives people 
maybe more freedom to say what they really think. Mm -hmm. They feel less under pressure than if you're sitting, you know, across a desk from each other, where it always feels a bit kind of interview vibes. And I do like some of the principles of stand-up meetings of the fact that you're, you know, potentially you're getting together, that they're probably more informal, that they're quicker. They're not necessarily stand-up meetings, but I've had lots of good meetings over a cup of tea, like standing up in like a kitchen area (laughs) where you're just going, oh, we just need 15 minutes. You are meeting somebody or a couple of people, but you're also kind of making a cup of tea at the same time. But then you get back to your desk and you think, actually, that was a really useful chat. So I can see how they're useful. A bit like you, I've never experienced them in the way that they're often described. You know, you have a stand-up meeting every day for X amount of time. Perhaps if anyone listening has and has seen them work really well, let us yeah, know because we'd, we'd, yeah. we'd love to learn more about them, especially where they've worked really, really well. Because I think I've seen kind of bits and pieces, but never the whole all working kind of really effectively. So um, the last most common piece of advice that you get <laughs> then in hand for proof meetings is to ban technology, like phones down, laptop shut, uh, be fully present in the meeting. I don't think I'm for this. I think we're going to be different here. <laughs> I don't think I'm for banning tech um, mm. because I think I'm more for for having short breaks maybe so that people... Because I think if, you, if you're in like a half day or a two hour meeting and you ban tech, I think after a point it can create a bit of um almost anxiety actually so you've got people who are like oh I that's need what text into you you see well i know i don't i'm not just talking about me personally i was digging into some research <laughs> about um millennials um which i guess i just about fall into the the camp of about how it's like one of the worst things that you can do to them is obviously take their tech away but not even not even in just a funny way in like a psychological way that it creates um the sense of anxiety and disconnect not having it and that obviously a lot of people will take their notes on their phone so then yeah you sort of actually it then is inefficient because they're going to have to start to write their things down on paper which is counter to the way they want to work and it just becomes frustrating and for some people introduces anxiety so I am in the camp of if you have to say ban tech and shut your laptops down then either the meeting might not be engaging enough (laughs) or if people aren't sort of naturally doing that or you think about well let's have an engaging shorter meeting and therefore I don't expressly need to make this point if I have to express the point, maybe there's something else going wrong. Yeah, I think it's how you're using the tech. So I actually wouldn't ban tech because I think now, as you said, too many people are using tech. And I don't mean too many in a bad way. It's just the way that people are evolving how they work as an integral part of how they make notes, take actions. So if that is how you're using your tech, if you are got everything else closed, all your notifications turned off, you aren't getting distracted by emails or anything like that or, or Slack... If you just have something up that is the way that you take actions and you're typing in actions as you go and, you know, or there's a document that you're referring to on a shared drive, you know, we would do that sometimes, then I think that's absolutely fine. I think in the best meetings I've been in, I have seen tech being used, but very purely, you know, like very purely in that way and and only for that purpose. Mm. Um, And I always think it's relatively obvious if people are doing other things, you know, if people are also checking their email or doing like looking at whatsapps or whatever because you know people can't engage in the same way you can't multitask you're not present you're not going to be listening properly you're not gonna be asking really good questions so i i think i am actually pro tech though not i wouldn't force it on people but i'm kind of pro tech as long as it's being used for the purpose of that meeting Mm. i think anything outside of that i'm actually really anti i go so far as to say i think it's actually really disrespectful and quite rude when people do that, borderline angry. I get, because I've seen it a lot <laughs> and I do actually get, because I just think, okay, well, if you're checking your email at the same time, just don't be here. If you've got something that's that urgent that you feel like you've got to have your emails open, I think in the vast majority of time people don't, but people do get this whole thing of people have got like quite addicted to it. And I think there are occasions where you think, oh, if this thing happens, then I've got to be able to leave. Well, I think just signal that or flag that at the yeah. start of a meeting, which I've also seen done really effectively so I've definitely been in meetings where I've said oh my little boy isn't very well today I'm really sorry I'm gonna have to keep my phone on just in case his nursery calls but then I think that's fine to do. One of the things I've seen work really well as a bit of a counter to people using tech but in a, in a nice way and it's, it isn't appropriate for every meeting but it's to get people sitting in a circle so if you get people away from the table mm-hmm. so let's say you're 
sharing information or coming up with an idea, then if you can get people away from the table, sit in a circle to share, there is something about that environment that means you can't look at your phone. Like it's very obvious if people are and it looks really, really awkward. Um, okay. And it's really, it's really not, and people share more, they really open up. Like I said, it's not, it's really good for like a team review. So yeah. if you're kind of having like a what's going on with the project, what's working well, what would be even better, or maybe even some ideas and the team could go around with like yes and building rather than yes. But those sorts of sharing, collaborating, building on each other's ideas, which arguably I'd love meetings to be about that more than just updating that could be done over email. Yeah. Um, the circle thing works really well as a natural way of people not being able to use the tech so much in that environment. Yeah, and Jill, I recently used Circles for a training session we were doing on feedback and it actually worked really well for that as well. And I hadn't done it with this intention. I'd done it because I thought, oh, this is going to be quite a difficult topic. It'd be good to not be kind of sitting in rows. Let's try sitting in circles. And we'd got two facilitators so I could kind of make that happen. And actually, it's probably the best session I've done on that particular topic. And I do, we were reflecting afterwards and we do wonder whether part of it was everyone was in a circle. There's not as many barriers in the way. You can kind of make eye contact, but it's not straight on from anyone because you're mm. in kind of a nice circular space. And I think I think there is something in that in, you know, just being able to go to different spaces for different kinds of conversations. Like we have a couple of sofas in one of the WeWorks that I work in sometimes. And I think sitting on a sofa can be quite nice. As soon as you sit on a sofa at work, and I know it's very um, co-working East London vibe, but it is quite a different conversation when you're sitting on a sofa versus when you're sitting in a meeting room with a very formal desk and, you know, it does often feel like you're having quite a serious conversation at that point. But I think you can have a serious conversation on a sofa, but perhaps it just feels easier to have, potentially. Yeah. So there are our kind of three most common bits of advice. We've got another few quick bits of wisdom from our own experience that we thought we would share with you, um, just to kind of wrap up this podcast around um, mastering meetings. So, Sarah, shall I maybe do two and you do two? Yeah, go for it. So my first kind of quick tip is when you are creating a meeting and running a meeting, try to create an environment where you are basically giving people the permission to either decline that meeting or leave it, which sounds really negative, but you don't want to be known as the person that has pointless meetings that people have feel like they have to sit in i think it's much more powerful if you can say i'm sending this meeting out my assumption or my understanding is that you would benefit or be able to contribute to this meeting if you don't feel that's the case please do let me know um so you've almost in the invite you're giving people an opt-out and then also in the meeting you might say this is the objective of the meeting this is what i think everyone's role is if anyone thinks that they could participate in a different way or the time's not best spent here then please like it's absolutely fine leave now i mean it's a little bit more awkward i think to do it in the meeting it's much better to do it before the meeting but the more that you can create the permission for people and the i guess the psychologically safe environment for people to confidently opt into a meeting or opt out of it i think the better it is for everybody so that's my first tip my second thing that can be quite useful as well is to rotate the meeting owner. This is particularly useful if you've got like recurring meetings. So like a recurring project meeting or team meeting or department meeting update. I think if you've got the same person presenting all the time, it can sometimes be a bit boring for everybody because you end up with the same sort of structure, the same sort of um, content and people will know what they're expecting and potentially tune in or out because of that so if you just rotate the meeting owner you will get new ideas the meeting will run and feel slightly differently for people and my experience of this is that it's often been better because of it because people just bring fresh thinking and fresh approaches in so definitely have a think about recurring meetings could you have some way of rotating the meeting owner for it Mm, that's a good idea. Actually, I've not seen that that much because often the person in charge sort of stays in charge. But I like the mm. idea of trying different people because actually being in charge of the meeting doesn't have to necessarily be the most senior person. So mm -hmm. I think that could work really well. The third kind of quick tip is think about when to actually hold your meetings. This is going to be different for every business because I think certain businesses have different pressures at different times. But I have seen this where, you know, you're, let's say you're a business where you're under a lot of pressure from maybe clients as the day goes on. The worst time then to have your meetings is later in the day because that's when people are most likely to be under pressure to be able to be responsive, go back to kind of client queries. And so then maybe banning tech is then quite a difficult ask when you're going, yes, but that's when I'm getting all of my queries coming in. 
So in which case, can you create an environment where you go, right, any meetings that we're going to have, we're always going to have them in the morning. Even small stuff, like I used to do a meeting at Sainsbury's every week where it was like 12 till, I think it was about either half one or 2 p.m. So obviously it's over lunchtime. And we all used to have to like basically run out and arrive with our lunch. And then you'd have to try and eat your lunch while doing actually what was a really important meeting. It was actually in the main a really good meeting. Like I don't like eating in meetings because I feel like I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm trying to concentrate and apparently I can't eat and concentrate at the same time. <laughs> um, and I remember thinking... I swear this meeting would be more effective if we just started half an hour later and basically agreed that everyone had like had a lunch break beforehand, had a half an hour to like grab some lunch beforehand. And I think it's small things like that that can actually make a really big difference and ask the people who are in your meetings when works for them. So Mm. if you don't intuitively know, which I'm sure lots of you listening just will, will know because of the people in your meetings, just say, right, we need to have this meeting to get together to do this thing. When would be the best time to do that? And see if you can actually include people in that decision rather than assuming. I read a few articles actually around meetings around going, the more you can include and the less you can assume, the better your meetings will be, which I thought was a really nice uh, phrase to kind of keep in mind. And then the last tip is a little acronym that I found, uh, which I've not used before, but I think is really useful, which is to always consider and potentially even share something called a gap before your meeting. So G-A-P. G is goal. So define the goal of your meeting, which is kind of what I was talking about, I think, earlier around outcome. So be really clear about what it is you're trying to achieve. A is for agenda. So we've talked about that. So it doesn't have to be a really formal agenda. Might just be, as Helen talked about, a couple of bullet points. And then P is prepare. So let people know if there is anything that you need them to prepare or think about. And bear in mind that you will get much better quality of thinking if you do let people know what you need to prepare. Certainly, you know, if you're talking to people like me who are more introverted, probably less good when they're kind of in the moment. If you let me know what you need me to think about, I'll probably come to that meeting with five ideas. If you tell me on the day, I might be able to offer one. So I can really kind of empathise with that the P of kind of prepare because I just know that I'm better given the opportunity to prepare. Some people won't be. Some people will go, oh, I know that's what I need to prepare. I can have a quick look, but I know I'm brilliant in the moment. But I think think about all of those people who are better when they've been given good quality kind of time and space before a meeting. So goal, agenda, prepare. I like it. Very efficient. (laughs) As always, all the resources for today's podcast uh, will be on the website. There's some really good articles about how to run an effective meeting, Management Today article on the science and fiction of meetings. I read a couple of really good Harvard Business Review articles on just how to improve your meetings. And they've actually got a whole section just on different things to do with meetings. So if this is a topic where you think, right, I'm going to do something about this, I'm going to do something about my own meetings, about my organisation meetings, some really good stimulus there for you to read and absorb and kind of work out what you want to do. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you do enjoy the podcast, if you could take a minute to review us um, on iTunes, we'd be really grateful. It really helps us to share the podcast with more people. And we do read and love and we love um, them. <laughs> share all of our reviews. Um, they're the best part of our week. We've said it before, but it really makes a really big difference to us. So thank you for people who've already done it. And if you do want to be part of our community, uh, you can follow us on Instagram at Amazing If or find us on Facebook. Or you can see both of us on LinkedIn or just email us at getintouchamazingif.com. And next week, we have a special guest episode for you with Scott Morrison, um, who is one of the authors of Creative Superpowers. And he's going to be talking to me a bit about why we all need to get really good at unlearning and relearning and how creativity can fuel better work for everyone. Scott is brilliant, really inspiring and funny. I got very philosophical in this discussion. (laughs) So um, if that's up your street, there's definitely a little bit for you. Scott, on the other hand, is very practical and will make sure there's loads of actions for you. I think it'll be a really good listen. I know it's a conversation that I really enjoyed. So I hope that translates into podcast for next week. So thanks for listening and we'll speak to you next week. Bye for now. Bye.